All right. Well, welcome. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for the anointing. Amen. Hallelujah. I've got an interesting word tonight. Uh, just I, I was having a quick look at a number of the untils in the Bible. All these tills or untils, and, uh, and they're good to have a look at. So I think we will begin. We're going to begin in a, in, a, in a fairly famous one, Acts chapter 3. All right, so we're going to look at the untils, or a bunch of them anyway. We won't get through all of them. But in Acts chapter 3, in verse, starting in verse 19, the, the apostle Peter is, is he's been given the opportunity because of a great miracle that's taken place, this man, a lame beggar, who, who's been healed, and now it's opened up an awesome platform for the word of God to come forth. And Peter says in Acts 3.19 to 21, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Hallelujah. So we have a clear, we have a clear verse here that Jesus is received or retained in heaven until something. Amen. And it's until the times of restoration of all things. Hallelujah. So this, this should always help us in terms of um, what, what people like to call eschatology, but really talking about end-time things and people's ideas of end-time things. But this is a, such a key verse that Jesus is received in heaven until the times of restoration of all things, spoken of, by, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So God's been speaking about this for a while. <laughs> Amen. He says since the world began, he's been talking about this. And so God, God's been on about it for a long time now, close to 6,000 years, somewhere around there. God's been speaking about the restoration of all things. Hallelujah. <laughs> so it's good for us to get on board. Amen. God's been talking about it for a while, and let's get on board with the restoration. Amen. So many people are still kicking against the restoration, or what they're waiting for is for Jesus to come back and just suddenly restore everything. Instead of saying, no, Jesus is coming back when there are times of restoration happening. Amen. Hallelujah. So we need to look for these times of restoration. And I just want to just give you a little look in on this word restoration. I'm just getting it up here. So this word, in the King James, it's the word restitution. And, um, and we, in the New King James, it's restoration. And it only appears in this, this one verse. How about that, this particular word? And it's, it's, it's a Greek word, apokatastasis. What a word, eh? And, and, the, and the, um, the, the strong concordance just gives it the meaning reconstitution. Now, that's pretty interesting, isn't it? The reconstitution. What happened when you got born again? You got reconstituted. That you became another substance. Amen. You got something substantial placed inside of you. And, and so you, you, you were restored. You were reconstituted. Hallelujah. And, and that word is used, the, the root of that word is used in a few other places where it talks about restore. Amen. Just the, the noun to restore, the verb to restore. So like the man, remember the man who stretched forth his, remember the man who had the withered hand and Jesus said, stretch forth your hand and his hand was restored or reconstituted. Amen. In other words, it came back to, to its original purpose and design. It, it was functioning the way it was always intended to. It was functioning in the God ordained way that it was always meant to. Hallelujah. And so this is what the restoration of all things is, things coming back to function the way God always intended them to. Hallelujah. In Matthew chapter 17 and verse 11, in Matthew 17 verse 11, it says, Jesus answered and said unto them, truly Elijah will, is coming first and will restore all things. Amen. I'll just get it properly. In the King James it says, 
Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. So there's this coming, there was this prophetic understanding that when when the prophet Elijah would come, and we, we understand that now to mean not the physical appearance of Elijah again, but the spirit and power of Elijah, as in like John the Baptist ministry, but more than just that, amen, that there's still a, in that passage, let me just read it in Matthew 17. I just want you to see this. And this is important because Jesus is retained or received in heaven until the times of restoration or reconstitution of all things, everything coming back to function the way God originally wanted it to. Do you know God has a plan for all of us to function the way he actually intended us to? Do you know what sin is? Sin is when we don't function the way God intended us to. That's when we miss the mark. That's sin. Amen. Sin means, the Greek word hamartia means to miss the mark. And we miss the mark when we don't function in the plan that God intended for us to walk in. We sin. Why do we get a saviour? We have a saviour to, to prevent us from failing and missing it. Amen. I shared a message. Can't even remember when it was now. Maybe it was a Sunday ago. Um, it's Shiloh, but I, it, it was called God doesn't want you to miss it. Amen. God does not want you to miss it. He does not want you to miss the intended plan for your life. Do you know he wrote a book? It says in Psalm 139, and it's in verse 16 and 17, it says that there's a book of your life. All the days that were fashioned for you are written in that book. So there's a book of Anne Strait that God has, and he's written down everything he intended for Anne Strait, all the days fashioned for her. And, you know, he's got, a, he's got one for Jim Strait, James Strait, sorry, James. <laughs> he's got one for Darlene. Amen. He's got one for John Ralston. He's got a book. And, he, and in that book, it's written down all the days fashioned for you when as yet, when as yet none of them were. And, you know, we can, we can walk in that book plan or we can miss it. We can decide to live our own way. Hallelujah. But God's restoring all things. We're living in the times of restoration of all things. And it began with you getting born again. Amen. When you got born again, you entered the restoration. It started. Amen. But don't block it from going further. Hallelujah. There's more than just being born again. There's the process then that, see, born again was not God's final end for you. God didn't just want us born again. He got us born again for a purpose, to become sons. Amen. To grow up to maturity and be sons of God. This is the restoration of all things. Amen. Because God wanted sons, mature ones, who could represent his kingdom and authority in the earth. Hallelujah. And so in Matthew, Matthew 17, I just wanted you to see this verse in verse 11 and 12. Jesus answered and said to them, indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already and they did not, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the son of man is also about to suffer at their hands. So what do we, what do we learn from this? Elijah came in John the Baptist, but Elijah is still coming. Hallelujah. So, so don't limit the prophecy of Elijah coming to John the Baptist only. Hallelujah. So John the Baptist fulfilled much of Malachi 4 in that sense. You know, he, he fulfilled that prophecy of Elijah coming before the great and dreadful day of Yahweh, turning the hearts of fathers to the sons, sons to the fathers. So that was fulfilled in Elijah, but uh, it fulfilled in John the Baptist, but not, not totally. Amen. Because Jesus said it in two ways. Elijah is coming first and will restore all things, but I say to you that Elijah has come already. Hallelujah. In other words, he's saying, look, it is being fulfilled in John the Baptist, but Elijah is still coming and will restore all things also. Hallelujah. And so we are in the times of restoration of all things. We're in the times of the spirit and power of Elijah being released on the church. Amen. And so in that sense, we're all to partake of that same sort of ministry that John the Baptist was functioning in because we're all to be about helping prepare a people ready for the Lord. Amen. Jesus is coming for a people ready for the Lord. And he's coming to a people whose the hearts of the fathers have been restored to the sons and the sons to the fathers. Amen. And so that we're in the times of restoration of all things. And so Jesus is received in heaven until the times of restoration. Like I said, it began with the born-again experience. But then there's more than that. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then, 
And then we need to we need to fully explore what that baptism of the Holy Spirit is and then go even further into the into the Feast of Tabernacles experience. Hallelujah. God fully indwelling us. Rivers of living water flowing from within. Hallelujah. Bubbling out. Fountains of living water coming forth out of our life. Amen. And so that word restore in Matthew 17, 11 is like the root word of that word restoration in Acts 3. Hallelujah. And so God is into restoration. Also, you know, in Mark chapter 8, verse 25, in the healing of a blind man, after that, Jesus put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up and he was restored. And he saw every man clearly. He was restored, reconstituted. His eyes worked because God made eyes to work. Amen. You know, he made eyes to be able to see. Hallelujah. He didn't make eyes to be blind. That wasn't God's purpose for eyes. God made eyes to see. And so there's a restoration, amen, to take place. Amen. And God wants to restore all things. Amen. So Jesus is received in heaven until the times of restoration of all things. And I could speak a lot about that. There's so many awesome prophetic verses. Read Isaiah 35. Uh, you know, read Isaiah 61, even that, that, that song we were singing before, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of Yahweh is upon me. Because why? He's come to heal the brokenhearted. That's part of the restoration. Amen. He's come to bring recovery of sight to the blind. That's restoration. So he's reconstituting all things. The church is to be restored, to function the way God intended it to be. Our, where to be restored? Our marriages, our families, our lives are to be restored into the image of God. Hallelujah. And so we can expect this restoration to take place. Amen. You're with me. So Jesus is received in heaven until the times of restoration. So if you want Jesus to come, what do you got to do? Decide to be part of the restoration. I am a part of the restoration that God is doing in the earth. And I can say, I'm a new creation, for Jesus has given me new birth. I hear a sound coming out of Zion that's stirring up the church to war. And in her midst, there's a celebration, such music I've never heard before. Hallelujah. Are you a part of the restoration? Amen. Don't get stuck in the mud. Keep moving in the restoration. Hallelujah. All right. Let's look at another aspect of the until here. Amen. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. I'll just see where we start reading. In verse 10 is the key verse. And... Um, yeah, we'll go from verse 7 just to get the whole context, but verse 10 is the key verse, okay? Hebrews 9, verse 7 to 10. But into the second part of the high, into the second part, meaning the most holy place, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing it was symbolic everyone say symbolic all right this is so clear language that first tabernacle was symbolic even the priestly duties were all symbolic okay it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience concerned only with foods and drinks various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until, everyone say until, until the time of reformation. Uh -huh. So there's all these regulations, religious rules, uh, food rules, drink rules, various washings, fleshly ordinances that were imposed even by God for a set time until the time of reformation. Hallelujah. So this is such a key verse, brethren, even to help people who get too, too engrossed in the Jewish thing, you know, get into the Hebrew roots where, where they go back to celebrating the feasts, go back to clean and unclean foods, 
go back to keeping Sabbaths as, as a means of like, you know, we got to do this because that's what we got to do as good, good Christians. You know, we got to become more Jewish and all that sort of stuff. No, no, those things were all symbolic and they were imposed until the time of Reformation. So what does that mean? They're no longer imposed. Amen. Why? Because we're in the time of Reformation. We are in the time of Reformation. When did that time of Reformation start? When Jesus came and finally when Jesus died on the cross, what happened? That te- the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom, torn from top to bottom. Amen. And it, the way was opened. Hallelujah. On the day of the resurrection, Jesus told Mary, don't cling to me. I haven't yet ascended to my father. What did Jesus do that day? He went to the father. He went into the holy of holies with his own blood, not symbolically now, but into heaven itself. It says in, in later on in Hebrews 9 and um, verse 24, Hebrews 9, 24, for Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, amen, which were copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. This is so awesome, brethren. We are in the time of reformation. We're in the time of reformation. Hallelujah. That word reformation, again, only appears in this particular verse in Hebrews 9, verse 10. And um, and it means rectification. It means to straighten thoroughly until the time of making things straight thoroughly. Hallelujah. I like that. Hallelujah. means to straighten thoroughly or to rectify. So until the time of rectification, reformation, making things right, reforming it in a right way. Hallelujah. So, brethren, don't get caught up in, in all that stuff. Because that stuff was imposed for a time, but it, it's, it was only for that particular period. Once Christ came, he came with the reality. Jesus is the reality. Let's just look in Colossians chapter 2, two verse 6. Well, we'll read it actually from verse 15 to 17. Colossians chapter 2. Isn't it good to realize that the, 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 the priestly things, the physical tabernacle, the sacrifices, the various washings, foods and drinks, fleshly ordinances, they were all imposed until. We've got to take a look at these untils. They're so important because many people still are continuing with something when the until has already passed. And when we do that, the book of Hebrews actually says we end up insulting the spirit of grace. We actually end up trampling the blood of the Son of God underfoot. Because we're thinking, we're saying that the sacrifice of Jesus wasn't enough. We're saying that what Christ did wasn't enough. I've got to, I've got to believe in Jesus and still eat, you know, keep away from pork. Or I've got to, I've got to believe in Jesus and I've also got to keep the Sabbath. Or I've got to believe in Jesus and no, there's no and. You've got to believe in Jesus. Come into the substance. Come into the reality. Amen. Because all of those things were imposed until the time of reformation. Christ came and rectified, reformed everything. Now we don't, we don't enter the tabernacle made with hands. Now we are the tabernacle. Hallelujah. And Christ has entered his tabernacle. Has he entered you? Has he put the blood in the most holy place in you? Has he gone right into that most? You know, I, I, I learned something awesome the other day. I was reading it in this book by Dave Robertson, this is a book about tongue. It's where he says the walk of power, the walk in the spirit, um, you know, the vital role of praying in tongues. And um, so anyway, this guy, he, he gave an awesome little thing. He said, you know, the devil, the devil can't access that most holy place in you. The devil can't access that born again spirit in you. That Because, that, that, you know, Christ has gone into that place with his own blood. The devil can't get in there. And, you know, when you, when you, even when you pray in tongues, you're praying in that language that's just between you and God. Amen. Yeah, hey, Tony. Hey, how you going? Yep. And so you can't, the devil can't get in on that. And so there's, it's an awesome place, you know, and to realize that in you, where you got born again, that's where Christ, the high priest, entered. He entered that place, the most holy place. 
That's the most holy place in the tabernacle is right in the core of your being, right in your spirit man. And that's where Christ has entered with his own blood. And he's cleansed your conscience from dead works. He's perfected your conscience by the blood. Hallelujah. He's gone right into the holy of holies in you. We're the tabernacle, brethren. Hallelujah. This is so awesome. I got the high priest in me. Hallelujah. Yes, the tabernacle not made with hands, John Atkins. Nice. Hallelujah. And so we, yeah, we weren't made with hands. We were, we were knit together in our mother's womb, weren't we? <laughs> but we were recreated, born again. Amen. And that's the tabernacle God lives in, the dwelling place of your spirit man. Hallelujah. And he dwells in there. Oh, this is awesome, brethren. Amen. Where was I going? Colossians 2, 15 to 17. So it says here, we're just seeing how things were imposed until the Reformation. Of, until the time of reformation it says in colossians 2 verse 15 having disarmed principalities and powers he christ made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them the principalities and powers in it the cross verse 16 so let no one judge you tell your neighbor on the screen next to you on the zoom screen let no one judge you <laughs> i'm going to look down on john rolston let no one judge you john Oh, you're right below me on the screen, okay? <laughs> Just look up. You'll see me. <laughs> so let no one judge you in food or in drink, all right? So if you're having a Coke, don't let anyone judge you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, you can use that one, can't you? But don't let anyone judge you on sort of religious matters, okay? Health matters is a little bit different, all right? Too much Coke is still not good. But don't let anyone judge you in regards to food or drink. Amen. What's clean or not clean in that sense. Hallelujah. Religiously. Or regarding a festival, and that's actually or regarding a feast day. Amen. So don't don't let anyone judge you saying, oh, you should be you know, keeping the Passover or doing what it is. You should be going to Jerusalem and celebrating Feast of Tabernacles and doing that. And that, that. No, don't let them judge you. And, when, and if they do, just say, read Colossians 2.16. Don't judge me. Yeah. Hallelujah. So festival there is a feast day. Don't let anyone judge you about a feast day or a new moon or Sabbaths. Don't let anyone judge you about Sabbaths. Amen. This Paul couldn't be clearer here. The Apostle Paul is being so clear here. Amen. Because why? We're in the time of reformation. Amen. We're in the time where things are being rectified, where we're coming to the true reality of the things that were shadows of the truth. And then it says, verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come. So guess what? Food and drink was a shadow. And you know the way I see it as the shadow? Where to eat clean food now. You know what the clean food is? Unleavened bread. You know what the unleavened bread is? It's Christ. He is the bread of life. He's that pure bread from heaven. Where to eat? We're not to partake of that leaven of the Pharisees. We're not to partake of the leaven of Herod. We're not to partake of of malice and wickedness, where to keep the feast of unleavened bread by, by eating of that bread of sincerity and truth. It's the word of God. So the clean and unclean food I see, uh, you know, and looking at verses like 1 Corinthians 5, 7 about how to keep the feast of Passover is that we partake now of a bread, we partake of the food which endures to everlasting life. We don't labor for the food which perishes. So God doesn't care if you eat prawns and crayfish and lobster, and he doesn't care if you eat pork and bacon. God's not really caring about that, okay, unless you're getting too much fat in your diet and you're going to die young. Then he might say, hey, settle down, okay, get, get off the fat a little bit, all right? But that's not a religious thing. That's just for your health, all right? But, but God's not concerned about the physical food. He's concerned about what are you feeding your spirit and your soul? What, what's the clean and the unclean? What are you feeding on? Jesus said you're women to feed on his flesh and on his blood. Amen. And so that's the clean and unclean food. He says, e eat of me and you'll, he said, he who believes in me will never hunger and he who comes to me will never thirst. See, he's got food and drink for us and his food and his drink is clean and we're not to partake of other stuff. Hallelujah. So we look at, we're in the time of reformation now. Amen. Don't let anyone judge you regarding feasts. We're to live in the reality of the feast now. 
Amen. Have you experienced Passover? If you've been truly born again, baptized into Christ, you, you've been in Passover, brethren. You're eating of the feast. Amen. The born again, the full born again experience with baptism in water is the feast of Passover experienced. Amen. If you've, if you've partaken of receiving the Holy Spirit and you're speaking with other tongues and, and you're learning to function in the gifts and the power of God, Feast of Pentecost is happening in your life. You're partaking of the feast. Hallelujah. And Sabbath, are you, have you entered the rest? Hallelujah. Are you learning to walk in the rest? Because the time of Reformation is not about keeping Saturday holy under the Lord. It's about walking in the rest, ceasing from your own works, walking by faith in the rest of God, walking now letting him do the works in you. Amen. So all of those other ordinances, foods, drinks, washings, they were all imposed until the time of Reformation. So, brethren, now we are in a different period. We are in the time of Reformation. So let's hang in there. Hallelujah. And let's help people come out of what was imposed before into the time of Reformation. Amen and amen. All right. Let's go to another until. Let's go to Matthew chapter 11, verse 13. So what have we had so far until, so Jesus is received in heaven until the times of restoration of all things. In other words, Jesus is not coming back from heaven until there's restoration taking place. Amen. Restor and rest restoration of all things. Hallelujah. Which even culminates with the sons of God manifesting, starting to deliver creation. Hallelujah. Then we've looked at that the religious things under the old covenant, the fleshly ordinances, feasts, all that sort of stuff, was imposed until the time of Reformation, and we've seen that we are in the time of Reformation, just like we're in the times of Restoration. Now Matthew chapter 11, and this sort of links in a little bit with what we've just been looking at. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 13. Hmm. It says, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. <laughs> That's an amazing verse. I still can't get over that. I saw that about five years ago, six years ago, that verse. And I, and I suddenly realized, wow. Did you know that in that sense, Old Testament prophecy ended at John? In other words, from the time of John onwards, all the Old Testament prophecy started to be fulfilled. Hallelujah. They prophesied until John. This is a huge shift. Many people still look at the prophecies in the Old Testament like, they're still going to happen sometime when it's like Jesus is saying we're in the period where they, where it's now happening. Amen. In other words, we're in that period of restoration of all things, which was spoken by God through the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. We're in the time of the fulfillment of everything the prophets have spoken. Wow. We're not in a time of still looking for the future. We're in a time of being established in the fulfillment of what was prophesied. And that is exciting, brethren, because that means when you read even the prophecies in the Old Testament, you can start to say, well, God, I want to walk in that now. And he can say, you can, my son. You can, my daughter. Hallelujah. Because all the prophets were prophesying until John. And now look in, look in the um, verse. And even it says there, and if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. Amen. That's what the next verse says. Are you willing to receive that? And then Luke, we'll go to Luke 16, Luke 16, verse 16. Check this out. The law and the prophets. So this is Luke 16, 16, real easy to remember. Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets were until John. So here's that until, okay? They were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached. And everyone is pressing into it. Wow. You know, before John, the kingdom of God was not preached. It was prophesied, but not preached. It was prophesied, but not proclaimed. It was prophesied, but it wasn't established. It was looking forward. The prophets or the law and the prophets were until John. That is so awesome. But now, since that time, since John, 
the kingdom of God has been preached. And everyone's pressing it. So we are in a time when we can press into everything that was prophesied before. Hallelujah. You know, Isaiah is full of those restoration type of prophecies. Guess what? They were prophecies concerning the kingdom of God. What do you think the kingdom of God looks like? It looks like restored places. It looks like healing. It looks like the earth doing what it was meant to do when God created it. Hallelujah. When the kingdom of God manifests, things come into order. Amen. Awesome. And so the law and the prophets were until John. We see we, we need to know where we are. And this little word until helps us know where we are. We're in the time that the kingdom of God is being preached. And if you know Rob Cochran, you'll know that we are in that time because he preaches the kingdom of God. Amen. One way. <laughs> One kingdom. Enter it now. How do you enter it? Be born again. The restoration begins and you start to enter the kingdom. You start pressing into that kingdom. And, brethren, let's keep pressing into the kingdom. There's so much more for the kingdom for us to come into in the kingdom, but we can have it now. We don't have to wait. We're not, oh, one day. No. It's actually got to do with how much you want it, how much you want to go in there. You can possess it. It's like when God said to Joshua and the children of Israel, the land there, I've given it to you. Now go in, possess it. The kingdom of God, I've given it to you. Go possess it. And guess what? We possess it little bit by little bit by pressing on into it. Because every time we press into it, we get a victory over something in our life. We lose something of the flesh. Something of the devil drops off us. Something of the flesh drops off us. And we enter more of the kingdom in our soul, in our whole being. Amen. And so we got to have a heart to enter, to press into the kingdom. Amen. It's not just good. It's good to be born again. That's like the initial entryway. But there's so much more to come into. The law and the prophets were until John. Now the kingdom of God is preached. And so what, what was being prophesied is now coming to pass. But it's coming to pass in our experience as we press in and possess that which has been given to us. Amen. Okay. Let's go to one. Now another until. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we'll do it from verse 20. Well, let's, yeah, let's go from verse 23. Key verse is 25. We're going to go from verse 23 to 26. 1 Corinthians 15. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruit, speaking about the resurrection here, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end. Then comes the what? The end. <sighs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, when Jesus comes, that's the end. There ain't no rapture and then three and a half or seven years, brethren. When Jesus comes, it's the end. Hallelujah. 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 It's pretty clear. Just read it then. Amen. Did you hear that? So each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits. afterward those who are Christ that is coming, then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. So what happens at the end? The, the coming and, and the end is the end of all rule and authority and power that is antichrist in any way. Amen. It's all done. It's all fully done. See, Jesus has disarmed them through the cross. He's defeated them already. And at the coming, it's ended. Amen. He puts an end to it all. Hallelujah. But it's already been accomplished. And so then it says in verse 25, for he must reign. Who? Christ. He must reign. So what's that? What's he doing right now? He's reigning. Hallelujah. Who's reigning? Jesus. But I can't see him. It doesn't matter. He's reigning. He's on the throne. He's on the throne and he's in you. Amen. And it says he must reign till. Everyone say till. Here's the until. He must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. Now, he, he is far above all of his enemies, okay? We know that from Ephesians chapter 1. Do you agree? 
He's far above all principality, power, might, dominion, every name that is named. He's already far above his enemies. So what has this got to do with? Well, Christ is also living inside of you, and he is reigning. And it says he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. So where is he putting those enemies under his feet? In you and me. He must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. And it says the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. death. What's the last enemy? Death. death. Hallelujah. The last enemy is death. And that's destroyed finally at the coming. Now he, amen. So he must reign till. So there's something happening until. And it, Jesus is reigning and he's doing it until all of his enemies are placed under his feet made a footstool for his feet. So we've got an awesome part to, a part to play in this whole program. Amen. The, the program of Jesus reigning and then coming, putting it into all rule and authority. Hallelujah. It's when there's a church, when there's a people who are walking in victory over all of his enemies. Hallelujah. So who wants to be a part of that number? Would you like to be in that number? Oh, when the saints walk in victory. Oh, when the saints walk in victory. <laughs> Amen. So we, there's got to be a company of people walking in victory over all the enemies. Hallelujah. So let's press in, God, everyone, to walk in victory over all the enemies. Amen. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 and 13 confirms this. Let's go there. Until. Hebrews 10, 12 and 13. But this man, hallelujah, but this man, hey, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of God from that time waiting till, until his enemies are made his footstool. So what's Jesus doing? He's received in heaven until the times of restoration of all things. He's waiting in heaven until all his enemies are made his footstool. Hallelujah. And, and even another way you can see that is even all his enemies that are still lingering in us are made his footstool until he's fully conquered us. Amen. Who knows that there's a, there's a process of getting conquered by Jesus. There's still little, little, little things that, arc up in us that uh, are rebellious against the workings of God in our own life. You know, we want to hang on to a little bit of bitterness, you know, because that person really did us, a, he, they did us over and they deserve to get punished by me if possible. <laughs> oh, that needs to be conquered. See, Jesus is waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. He's waiting for perfection. Because then it goes on to say, verse 14 of Hebrews 10, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. The sanctification process is his enemies becoming his footstool in you until we no longer are any, in any way his enemy. We're, not, we're no longer working against him. We're no longer thwarting his plans. We're no longer looking for a different way. Amen. Hallelujah. And so... You know, there's that beautiful verse, I think it's Psalm 99, verse 5, but it says, exalt Yahweh, our God, and worship at his footstool. And so he's waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Because what happens at his footstool? Worship. We, at, the, at his footstool, we exalt him and we worship at his footstool. So he's waiting till his enemies are made his footstool until, until we, until there's a people who are completely, purely worshipping him with everything within them, no enemies. Hallelujah. Whoa. Can you believe it with me? Amen. All right. So I wouldn't, we, we wouldn't be able to um, finish this teaching, would we, without looking at Ephesians chapter 4, the great until. All right, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 13, Ephesians chapter 4. But you see how all this works together. Until times of restoration of all things, 
Until his enemies are his footstool, they're so linked. Amen. And the time of reformation is so linked to John, right? So that those those other things, the, the law, the, the old covenant ordinances were imposed until the time of reformation, which we're in. And the law and the prophets were until John. But since that time, the kingdom has been preached and everyone's pressing into it. So the time of reformation began with the preaching of John saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen. That's everything started to shift from that moment on. And, and so now this restoration of all things is so linked into Ephesians 4 as well here. So Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 13. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till or until we all come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that's the until, the great until. So Jesus has given five ministries to be equipping or perfecting the saints, doing the work of the ministry, building up the body of Christ, building that dwelling place, amen, that house of the body of Christ until we all come to the unity of the faith. This is restoration of all things until this church is fully restored and functioning, reconstituted until this church is, is functioning as a perfect, mature man at the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so it's very interesting, you know, those five ministries will function until. So there is coming a time when there will be no more need for those ministries. Amen. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. But we see snippets of it. You know, when, when, when brethren, uh, even with us, are coming to maturity, you know, it becomes less and less that we that we are, you know, acting like an apostle to them. It becomes more and more like we're functioning as friends. We're functioning together. We're, we're, we're disciples. We're sons of God together. Hallelujah. Amen. And so we're functioning in some level of maturity when that begins to take place. Hallelujah. So there's these ministries functioning until we all come to the unity of the faith, to the, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, let me just give you a couple more to finish on. Mm, I'll go to Hebrews 3. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6. And this can be a good exhortation here. I'll read it from verse 5, Hebrews 3, verse 5 and 6. It says, And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, firm to the end. That, that to the end could be until the end. It's the same Greek word. Firm until the end or to the end. So what's the encouragement here? We've got to stick it out until the end. Amen. Tell your neighbor on Zoom, don't give up. Don't jump out of the boat. You know, so many people end up jumping out just before they're about to get there. They didn't realize how close they were and they jumped ship. You can see it from your position. They don't see it, but you can see it. You're like, oh, just, it's like you just, you just got another couple of meters and then you'll be on top of the hill. Oh, it's too high. And they leave. And you're like, oh, you were so close. You got to stay firm until the end. Until the end. Amen. Until the end. Let's also look at the uh, same chapter, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 3, 14. So we're right there. I'm just going to get it on here too. So it says this. It says, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So in both of them, what are we meant to do? We're to, we're to hold fast the confidence. 
So this is two, two verses which is telling us where to hold fast the confidence. That confidence is, um, is the Greek word hypostasis, and it means setting under, support. It, figuratively, it means essence, or concretely, sorry, essence, or assurance. Amen. So we're to hold fast the beginning of our assurance. We're to hold fast that support, steadfast to the end, steadfast. And that word steadfast means stable. Amen. That which is, you know, forming a foundation. We're to hold it steadfast with stability till the end. And it's such an important thing to have some stable, to be a stable person. Amen. When you're stable, guess what? Other people who aren't so stable will find some stability. As you, st- as you hang in there till the end, you become like a pillar in the house of God. And, and you probably don't understand how important you are. You might sometimes just think, oh, I haven't really done too much. But, but by simply being there and remaining where you are and being who you are consistently, that is such a blessing to the whole body of Christ. You become stable. You become a pillar. You become someone that's depended on, and, and it's good, amen. It's good to be in that place. Imagine, imagine if I just decided, oh, uh, I've had enough, you know, just, I don't know, going to do something else, going to become an electrician and um, just going to leave it all, you know. Imagine if I did that. Imagine the amount of people I would disappoint. Imagine, imagine the amount of people that would just go, oh, what? Imagine the hole that would make. But guess what? All of you. It does that. You know, it affects the whole body. When we are people who stand firm till the end, it provides such a strength to the rest of the body, probably more than you would, more than you could ever imagine. Sometimes you think, oh, it wouldn't matter. If I just left, no one cares about me anyway. That's a lie of the devil. Amen. Get that little thing out of you, that fox. You know, grab him by the tail and do a Samson on him and then start his tail burning. <laughs> Hallelujah. Get that fox. Run it out of town. Because it's you, you are important in the house of God. And to stand firm, holding the beginning of your confidence and assurance firm to the end, you know, that does so much for the new believers. It does so much for the immature believers. You know what does so much damage to immature believers? When they see people that they thought were mature, that they could depend on, suddenly they're, they're gone. And, uh, and that does so much damage. But let's be people who hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. All right, what's this end? This word end is the Greek word telos, and it means to the limit, to the conclusion, to the act or state of termination, to the result, to the ultimate purpose. This is what this word means. Amen. Until, until it's all said and done, you could say. So it's to the limit. When, when have you got to stand firm till? To the limit, to the end, until the purpose is accomplished. Hallelujah. Oh, until the goal is reached, until the result has been accomplished. Amen. That's a strong word, the end. That would be a good study to do too, to the end. Wow. Amen. And so let's go to Matthew 28, still on this end. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, because, again, Jesus tells us that we're to keep going till the end. It's a bit of a different word for end here, but this is what it says in Matthew 28, verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. And this word end, it's similar in that, so the other word end was telo, telos, this word is soon telaya, and it means it, the entire completion. That is the consummation. Amen. Until everything finds its, it's, it's very simple, until it's entirely completed. Amen. So, so we're to keep up making disciples, baptizing those who believe, and teaching them to observe everything Jesus commanded. We're to keep doing that, brethren, until it gets really scary and World War Three starts. No. 
until there's food shortages and we go into our bunkers with canned food. No. We're to keep making disciples, baptizing and teaching them to observe everything Jesus commanded until the end. Amen. Until so does that mean even when war is going on? Yep. Does that mean even when there's crisis everywhere? Yep. We keep, what do we do? We, we cry and, 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 and go to into a refugee camp? No. What do we do? We make disciples. We teach them to observe everything Jesus commanded, and we do that until the end. Hallelujah. And so, God, it's so important, brethren, that we remain people who are steadfast to the end, unto the end, until the end. So what do we look at tonight? We looked at a few untils. Amen. That Jesus is received in heaven until the times of restoration of all things. So there's a restoration taking place of all things. And, and we could probably link that with the one that I did with he must reign until all his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. He, he, he's at the right hand of God waiting till, until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. Yes, John, amen, until the mystery is finished, until the mystery of God is finished, until the end. Hallelujah. And then we also looked at that there was religious ordinances under the old covenant that were imposed until the time of Reformation. And so we are in the time of Reformation, so we're no longer under those religious ordinances that were imposed under the old covenant. Amen. But we're in a time of Reformation. We're in the time of fulfillment. So John, it, Jesus said of John the Baptist, the law and the prophets were until John. From that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and many are pressing into it. So the fulfillment, the time of Reformation is characterized by a time of the kingdom of God bringing to fulfillment and completion everything the prophets had spoken of. Amen. Then we looked at also that, uh, that, we, that um, Ephesians 4, that there are five ministries given until we come to perfection as the church until the church is functioning in maturity at the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And then we looked at being firm in our confidence and assurance until the end. Hallelujah. So it's very important to recognize these untils so that we know where we're at. Amen. And it can totally affect our, our understanding of eschatology, all the, all the things that to, to get out of that world of, conjecture and, uh, and, and, and opinions and ideas. But what are we to main focused on? We're to be making disciples, baptizing, teaching them to observe everything until the end. And Jesus said, Lord, I'm with you always until the end. So he's with us doing that until the result, until the purpose is fully accomplished. So let me pray. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Father, I, I pray that this word would bring a great help and encouragement into our spirits. God, that we would, we would see the importance of that little word until in all those different contexts, that we'd be excited, oh God, about the the place that we are in right now, the realm that we're living in right now of things being fulfilled, the time of reformation, times of restoration. Father, thank you that you are restoring all things. And we can thank you for the restoration taking place. You're actually making your enemies a footstool so that we can worship you with everything within us at your footstool. God, you're waiting until there's a people who are worshiping entirely, purely, in spirit and truth, worshipping the Father in the earth. Hallelujah. So, God, release your anointing in all of us to be on that journey, to continue on that journey until the end. God, to, to see your work accomplished in our life, to see the restoration and the, and the regeneration taking place in our life until the end. In Jesus' name. Amen. Keep taking the Lord's table till he comes. Amen.